Once the radar locks on the ground and insight is about one kilometer above the surface, the lander will separate from the back shell and begin terminal descent using its 12 descent engines. Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes. <laughs> Standing by for lander separation. Carrier interruption on Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo. Lander separation commanded. Yes. Altitude 600 meters. Gravity turn, altitude 400 meters. We're getting there. 300 meters. 200 meters, 80 meters, 60 meters, 50 meters, constant velocity, 37 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, 17 meters, standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. Square. Boy, people are weathering the rain to see this. <laughs> they can't help. Today and the, and the days that follow, before the science can begin. But you know, just getting a vehicle on from Earth to the surface of Mars is no mean feat. And, and Rob, could you talk about that? I mean, just the mere accomplishment here that we're seeing. It, it's you have to understand that this 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 vehicle is very it's very complicated. Um, it uses 12 engines. Each of those engines are pulsed. 10 times a second, producing these little tiny uh, impulses, almost like little bullets that keep the vehicle uh, going at a constant velocity as it, as it approaches the ground, and still going o over five miles an hour. So those legs feel a fair amount of crush. We still don't know the state of the vehicle right now. We need to look to make sure there are no rocks nearby. The solar panels have to, are, will be in just, a, in just a few, uh, in about five to 10 minutes, will begin to open up. They have to waiting for the dust to settle because the dust were, was certainly a lot of dust being lifted in the air around the vehicle right now, which is now just settling. 
So we're standing by after touchdown. It waits um, a, a couple of minutes to give us an X band beep. And so we are standing by for that. It's a communication that comes directly to Earth from InSight. Yes. Um, and, and it goes uh, to, to the Deep Space Network. There's also something that might be happening now, if we're very lucky. Uh, InSight might be able to relay uh, a, an image or a parcel image taken just a few, a couple of minutes after landing. So I'm, I'm standing by hoping to see that. But if that doesn't happen, we'll certainly get more images later. Uh, in our Odyssey Pass in well, about five hours. We see Bruce Banner waiting for it. They're, 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 they're I, I don't for, know if they see it yet. They're waiting. <laughs> that's, that's Justin Mackey and Bruce Banner uh, looking carefully at the cameras to see what they might see. Uh, they're now, waiting for the image to come back. So this is the first image from InSight itself. InSight Correct. is taking a picture with one yes. of its two cameras. Yes. It's probably a uh, view of what's directly in front yes. of the spacecraft right yes. in front of the lander. This is a camera that it would be using to figure out, is this a good space? Exactly. Is it a good place to put down our instruments? So it is going to take an image and send that image to the Marcos. The Marcos, in turn, will relay it back down to Earth. That's correct. They got it. And oh, no. Let's, let's, let's just wait. Let's see what they saw. There it is. Whoa, what? Great. I don't see a lot of. Uh, I don't see a lot of. Uh... Let's explain that image. Now, this image has a dust cover on top EDL of it. EDL com. We have so, lost the signal for Marco. You can see potentially a lot of. Uh, uh, radio signs. A lot of debris that might be uh, on the camera. For UHF. So we don't know what I'm looking Thank at. Thank you, like, everybody on EDL com. All right. Yeah. Yay, Marco. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, there it is. You can see a better view. You can see that really is debris. And there is the horizon back there, uh, the bluish sky. Uh, uh, that's part of the lander deck on the front left. Um, I can't take out, but it looks like there's not a lot of rocks in the field of view. But those dots you see there are very likely to be dust particles on the, on the lens, the dust cover, the dust which cover. will be removed. And we'll and get moved. another shot yes. later on. Yes, um, and a amazing. better, clearer view after the dust cutter is removed. So, um, it, uh, Insights, um, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, 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 CubeSat's relay communications job is done. They're now flying on. They're now taking pictures back toward Mars. Uh, uh, hopefully, MRO, which flew overhead, might have been lucky enough to capture the descent of this InSight lander on its, under its parachute. Uh, while, was, while, while though this was going on, it, MRO was flying overhead, recording the data, uh, um, like a, also monitoring the tra transactions and recording every bit of signal it could. And, but it also had the ability to take a picture. And maybe we'll, like we did with, with uh, both Phoenix and later for Curiosity rover, we might be able to see the parachute inflated That as well. would be fantastic. We are standing by now for that X-band beat. Yes. Insight phoning home saying, I'm here and I'm okay. System based on inside court, the DSN and expand. Uh, Radio science reports expand carrier detected. <laughs> DSN and expand radio science have acquired the expand touchdown. Copy that, thank you. Flawless. Perfect. Flawless. 
we've got the beep. We've uh, this was perfect case scenario. This is this is what we really hoped and imagined in our mind's eye. Uh, that we spend most of our looking visualizing all these bad things can happen. <laughs> That's true, um, and, and sometimes <laughs> things work out in your favor, and we'll look very carefully at the data to see what might have. Uh, how well it went, um, it, it, but it certainly looked like it was a very successful and perfect landing. We'll have to see uh, as we get more data um, how well things go. And right, and, and, and as the uh, as the vehicle proceeds, the solar panels will be deployed. Hopefully, there's no we're not on a tilt. It doesn't look like we are, but um, from the image, but um, the solar panels will be deployed safely. We hope, and we'll get confirmation of that around five o'clock. Uh, local time here in, 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 in about four hour, four and a half hours, five hours from now. And, and this is such a difficult feat in that because of the one-way light time, there is no way that any of these engineers could possibly control the vehicle. No. It all has to be done in commands and software. It's, we have to train it to do this work on its own. Uh, radio science report, nominal carrier, 30 seconds past the first acquisition. So we're all nominal on the surface. So the vehicle is completely nominal, reported nominal. Uh, it is, uh, it's happy. The lander is not complaining. Um, we, have a, we had a way to tell us if it was unhappy, uh -huh. uh, and it wasn't. It's not unhappy. It's, quite, it's, it's, uh, it's in a normal mode, uh, and so it's going to chug along for the rest of the, rest of the afternoon on Mars and finish the activities. All right. Well, Rob, I know you're anxious to get in and yes. congratulate I, the I crew. Am. Thank you so much for Thank sitting you. here Thank and helping so us out it explain EDL. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll let you go and go congratulate your friends. Thank you. All right. Take care. Loop recording completed at All right, as we had promised, we said we'd bring back the administrator to get your take on what was it like to be in that control room. Jim, what was it like? Well, I'll tell you, it was, um, it was intense, and, and you could feel the emotion. Uh, it was very, very quiet when it was time to be quiet, and, of course, very celebratory with every little new piece of information that was received. Um, it's very different being here than watching it on TV <laughs> by far. I can tell you that for sure <laughs> now that I've experienced both. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, what's, what's amazing is as soon as it was over, I got a call on my cell phone, and it was, uh, the phone number was all zeros. And whenever I get a phone call that's all zeros, it's got to be somebody important. <laughs> I answered it, and it was the vice president. Oh, my gosh. He watched the whole thing. Um, he okay. is absolutely ecstatic about our program. As you're aware, he's the chairman of the National Space Council. Um, and he's been, uh, of course, uh, a keen advocate for what we do. Um, and... Uh, to have him call within seconds of, of mission success is, is tremendous. And just so everybody knows, 
He wants me to say congratulations to everybody here at NASA and all of our international partners and everybody who has um, contributed um, to this mission. Uh, what, what an amazing day for NASA. It is an amazing accomplishment in that this is something that is happening millions and millions and millions of miles Absolutely. away, and these people are able to do it. Incredible. And what's fascinating is the whole time I'm watching it, I'm thinking, uh, every milestone is something that, it, that happened eight minutes ago because that's yes. the time lag to get a signal from Mars to Earth. Yes. And so it's, it's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting, but then you have to step back and realize that this has already occurred in history. Uh, so it, it is, it's a unique experience, incredible. And uh, just the, the enthusiasm here is incredible. So what's for the future? Looking ahead, 2020? Well, let's get through December. Uh, <laughs> so for the, for the rest of this, we think about what's happening next. Uh, December 3rd, we're launching American, another American astronaut to the International Space Station. So that's going to be a big achievement. And it's going to be on a, on a Russian Soyuz rocket that the last time we launched a human right. was not successful. That was scary. Um, it was scary. Um, but we, we figured out what the problem is. We're moving forward. And now we've got that underway December 3rd. Um, going forward from there, we're going to get the first science data back from the Parker Solar Probe on December 7th. So that's not too far away either. And then we've got uh, OSIRIS-REx that will be in orbit around Bennu um, shortly after Christmas. So uh, no shortage of exciting things. And then on, on January 1st, um, we're, we're going to fly the New Horizons mission, which for people who are not aware, that's the mission that went to Pluto back in 2014, gave us stunning images and data and information science on, on Pluto. And now that mission is still going strong. It's, it's in the, the, what we call the Kuiper Belt now, which is an asteroid belt well beyond Pluto. And it's going to be taking images of uh, Ultima Thule, which is uh, an object in the Kuiper Belt, Kuiper belt which we, we have never been able to go out there and take images of anything at close range before, and now we're doing it. So y you ask what's happening next. Uh, <laughs> I'm I sorry yeah. I asked. <laughs> we, we have, right now at NASA, there is more underway um, probably than, I don't know how many, how many years passed, but it's like, you know, there's a drought, and then all of a sudden there's all these activities all at once. So we're busy. Uh, we're going to be working through the holiday but a lot of amazing discoveries to be made, and we're looking forward to it. It's so funny because our Ask NASA question you basically answered is, does the success of NASA InSight influence the timeline for future manned lunar or Mars missions? Well, certainly everything we learn about Mars at this point is going to help us understand how to do in situ resource utilization. So InSight could actually provide some really good information about whether or not there's liquid water on Mars and maybe even where it is and how to get to it. Um, we strongly believe uh, that there's liquid water, you know, 10 kilometers under the surface of Mars. Um, so the, the, the key is, um, the answer is yes. The more we learn, the more we're able to achieve. Um, and so to get to Mars, yes. But the lunar missions, the, the, you know, the president's first space policy directive is to go to the moon, to go sustainably with international and commercial partners. So when we say sustainably, that means we're going to have reusability built into the system. And we're going to we're going to test and prove technologies at the moon that ultimately we can replicate at Mars. So we're going to retire risk, prove human physiology at the moon, which is only a three day journey, which means, um, you know, if something goes wrong, you can get home safely. We saw that with Apollo 13. Um, but we need we need to use the, the moon as a proving ground to accelerate our path to Mars. In the meantime, we're doing missions like InSight to learn as much about Mars as possible. InSight is going to help us understand really asteroid impacts as well. You know, because uh, it's, it's got a seismometer, which is going to help us know how often is Mars getting impacted with asteroids. And if we're going to send humans there, it'd be important to know if those humans are going to experience <laughs> asteroid impacts. So, and, and that's pretty much our goal, is always learn from our missions and build upon those missions. One after another. NASA has a long history of doing just amazing work in building on its past successes and, in fact, its past failures. That's so, true. Um, I, I'll tell you, what an amazing time to be at the helm of this extraordinary agency. Well, we are so glad that you are here Thank to you. share it with us. Well, again, Thanks for joining a, us. It's a true pleasure. Thank All you. All right, that. and I'm sure you need to go in there yes. and celebrate with those folks, but thank you for stepping out for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thank you All so right. much. Take care. Now, Mars exploration is cool stuff, but if you're not convinced just yet, just talk to the InSight scientists and engineers. No one conveys the excitement more than the people who actually work on the mission. 
So earlier this year, the outreach team filled up a van and went to 15 California cities. They called it the Insight Roadshow. So we're here in San Francisco at the Exploratorium, and this is part of Insight's Roadshow. Since it's the first interplanetary mission we've ever launched from California, we're actually doing a lot of public engagement activities along California. And we're just talking to the public and talking to them about insight and getting them excited and sort of sharing information that they probably wouldn't get uh, just from a website. We have Mars Globes and Touchables kits. We have a replica of the actual launch vehicle that's going to be taking Insight to Mars. We have a selfie station with fun props. People can take pictures. Children really, really like Mars. We have a jump station where we invite uh, kids to come in and jump. We have a little seismometer on the floor which measures ground motion. So if students can come and jump next to it, they can actually see their recording on the screen and they make their own quake. I've had people come to me and say, this is the most I've ever understood about a space mission. I'm so happy I came because now I understand what you're doing, I understand why it's important, and I'm really excited. You kind of imagine how it looks, but seeing it in person actually puts it in perspective. She was able to explain a lot of what happens, the cameras, what goes into the ground. It's a great exhibit, you know, both for myself and also for kids that want to learn about Mars. Okay, we want you to meet another Mars veteran here at JPL. Our director, Mike Watkins, you were a mission manager for Curiosity. Absolutely. I think this is the fifth Mars mission I've worked on. For really? Fifth uh, Mars lander. So uh, maybe we're getting the hang of it finally. <laughs> <laughs> does it ever get better? I mean, does it get old? It's always the you same? Know, it doesn't. I mean, I think we're just as nervous every time. I, you know, the whole landing sequence, and it's just such a crazy time, and, and you know, we can't do anything. It's this feeling of helplessness, right, because the spacecraft's on its own, and everything we, you know, we could do, we did a day ago. And uh, so I think you just always have that nervousness. But, uh, you know, we have confidence in the team. We have confidence in the engineers and scientists that they did everything that they could do. And, uh, and you have to put it in their hands. And it's our eighth successful landing. So we learn from this. We learn a little more. We do it better the next time, pretty much. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, ha we have had one failure. We learned from the failures, too. So, um, in fact, uh, in, in, we learned from all the failures from all the missions, even if they're not JPL missions or NASA missions. Uh, each one of them tells you a little something, an extra test you should do, an extra thing you should guard against, uh, you know, in the Mars atmosphere or, or on touchdown. And so we've learned from all of these, and uh, luckily we've been, uh, we've, we've recently been very successful. And we're always trying something new. We're always trying to learn something new. We had a situation this time. Odyssey couldn't be in place to give us bent pipe communications. And so Marco came about. Oh, the Marco is just an incredible success story. You know, exactly as you said, we, we couldn't have uh, Mars Odyssey do the real-time bent pipe uh, for the EDL events. We would have had to wait a couple of hours and, and, and have the, the replay from uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, so we, we embarked on this kind of crazy idea to build these two little CubeSats. And, you know, CubeSats are something that high school kids can build these days. But they, they go up and they go around the Earth. They go around the Earth. Right. These are the first interplanetary CubeSats. First time we've ever sent CubeSats outside the, the Earth's orbit. And their sole purpose was to do the relay. So they had this very cool X-band planar uh, flat antenna there. Um, and they relayed the, the, the UHF signals uh, in real time for us. And it was just amazing. It's built by a lot of early career folks here at JPL with a little bit of adult supervision. But uh, no, they, the, the engineers, they just did a fantastic job on Marco. It exceeded all of our wildest expectations. They worked perfectly. We built two because we thought maybe one will get there. They both got there. They both worked. It's just a great tribute to the whole, the Marco team. You saw them in there. They had their special black shirts. Yes. Uh, just a fantastic thing. And, and not only did it work for this mission, but I think it opens up the door for more small missions like that. You know, we could actually put cameras on them. We could put other instruments on them. They're much less expensive. So there, there's, I think, a whole, new, a whole new door. We just opened a door to a new class of, of planetary science, uh, thanks to the Marcos. And so, uh, for the CubeSets, they were just made with off-the-shelf parts. Some, yeah, you know, some combination of off-the-shelf parts and some new stuff that we did. We had to build a special radio, of course, because it has to talk to the Deep Space Network. Uh, the antennas are a little bit... Uh, um, new technology, but a lot of the stuff is pretty pretty standard stuff that uh, that you could replicate at, at much lower cost. So, what do you think in terms of the future that 
Other missions will be carrying their own relays and not having to depend on a bent pipe from a, a orbiter. You know, they might carry relays. They might actually carry scientific instrumentation. You know, they, they they can do more than just do relay. They can actually take pictures. You know, they they could uh, they could do spectrometry. They could do lots of other stuff that we that we uh, we'd like to do with orbiters. And so there's a chance we could send them to Venus. We could send them to asteroids. We could send them to to, to Mars. I mean, there's lots of stuff we can do. And I think we're just learning the capability of of, of what we can miniaturize and what we can put on these cubesats. But th this is a great, you know, a, a great first first effort. Absolutely. Well, we have one question for you. It's a social media question from George K, age nine, from the UK. How long did it take to plan and build this mission, Insight? Well, that's a great question. So I have, I have two answers to that. Okay. Insight itself. Typically, our missions take from the time we start the mission to the time we 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 uh, launch it. It's about four to five years. In the case of InSight, two, two things happened, one to our advantage and one not to our advantage. The first is we had a lot of heritage from a mission called Phoenix. So a lot of the design work had already been done because it was done for this mission Phoenix, even before that for Mars Polar Lander. So a lot of the basic design we kind of inherited for this mission. On the other hand, we had a little bit of bad luck in that the instruments, the seismometer is so unbelievably precise is so incredibly accurate and hard to build that we couldn't quite get it ready. So we're doing that in partnership with the French and a lot of other countries in, in Europe, including the UK and Switzerland and, 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 uh, and other folks. We couldn't quite get that ready to go for launch. So we had to actually wait two years and took an extra two years then because of that. So Mars and the Earth are only lined up to launch about every 26 months. So we had to wait another 26 months. So that took us a little bit longer. Well, speaking of the internationals, that's a perfect segue for where we're going next. Throughout this program, we've been trying to introduce you to the people behind the scenes. And for the InSight mission, it requires that we go beyond our borders. This is truly an international mission. Let me introduce you to Domenico Giardini, a Swiss-Italian scientist who studies earthquakes and Marsquakes. Some of us have been in this mission for 20 years. It's a lifetime project. I'm Domenico Giardini. I'm an Italian living in Switzerland. Uh, I work on earthquakes, and therefore I will work on mass quakes. I'm a professor at university. Seismic risk, seismic hazard are my main field of applications. Inside is a mission which is geared to measure the physical parameters that help us to characterize the interior of Mars. There are two main reasons why it's important to do by international cooperation. There is a big motivation coming from all the different parts to complete it and the community grows much faster and the knowledge grows much faster. The Swiss role in this mission to deliver the electronics for the seismometer and we will provide daily routine analysis and check if there are seismic events or meteoritic impact in the planet itself. This is what our students will work on, how the planet develops and what is the future. And that has a direct relevance on how we understand about the Earth. It's so interesting. And that partnership goes far beyond individual scientists. Take a look at this. It is a picture of the calibration tool on the deck of the InSight lander. It's what the team uses to calibrate the cameras on Mars. And notice the flags and logos. It's recognition of our international partnerships with the French, German, a French government space agency, CNES and also the German Aerospace Center, DLR. And it is my pleasure to welcome SICE Project Manager, Philippe Lede from CNES, and Executive Board Member, Hans-Jörg Dietos from DLR. So I, I can't imagine a better day. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah, was your really reaction? Day, yeah. So yeah. I am very enthusiastic and very grateful for all the people of the mission and also my thoughts my thought are, are going to the team, the CNES team and to the science team, to Bruce Bannert and to Philippe Lognonet. Now we have a marvelous picture of the ground and now the work to deploy the seismometer is beginning. So a new adventure in the best conditions. Thank you for that. Definitely a new adventure. Hans Jörg, uh, what's your feeling? The HP cubed is on that deck. It will be ready to go. Yeah, it's now, it's now a job now. But first of all, I'd like to congratulate our partners here in the U.S. And this was a great day and a great job they did. It's not easy to land on Mars. That's what we know. And it's a dream for me as well, because the first time that we land on Mars with uh, an instrument, at least, uh, at least as I has experienced it. And so it's, it's a great day. And um, it was really exciting so far. Now the job starts for us. 
Well, it's funny, Philippe, you had once said, you're a mu musician as well, you're, he plays jazz. You see exploration and music very similar. Yeah, How's yes, that? very similar. Because the human uh, management of all that activity is exactly the same. The technique, it's different. You have a psychometer and you have a, an orchestra. <laughs> but the whole thing to find the best talents and things like that are exactly the same. And to deliver on time, to be ready, and to have the best performances. Everything is similar. And we should let people know that we won't be able to be collecting science right away. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. We will be collecting science, what, several months from now? We are beginning. The deployment is going to take about two or three months. Of course, we will have some data during the deployment, but the best data to make the best science will be uh, about the beginning of March. All right. So, so we prepare now. And we prepare now. Yeah, now it's, it's, uh, it's the time. Yeah, but um, it was a great job so far also from, for our team and our teams, all the teams. And as you said, it needs a lot of people to bring it up to. Uh, to Mars and make it a successful mission. Yeah. Well, I have to say congratulations. Yeah. congratulations. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Well, here's another profile now. Meet Ravi Prakash. It's his job to keep Insight healthy on Mars. We get to explore the universe and see things that no one has ever seen before. My name is Ravi Prakash, and my job is to keep Insight healthy when it's on Mars. InSight is the first spacecraft that's going to go to Mars and try to understand how rocky planets have formed. Spacecraft team, how's power looking? A healthy InSight spacecraft is healthy batteries. We have heaters all over our spacecraft that keep our spacecraft warm enough so that it operates the way it should. Power is nominal, spacecraft battery fully charged. We look at these things as well as many other parts of our spacecraft on a daily basis to make sure we have a successful mission. There are thousands of people working on InSight, so the systems engineers are responsible for understanding how changing one part of the spacecraft ripples through the entire system and how that affects all the other parts of the spacecraft. I actually worked at JPL for eight years and then left for about three years to work for a nonprofit where I used my engineering and design skills that I learned at NASA to help people in poverty. I realized that the stuff we do here impacts billions of people around the world. Every single person, whether they realize it or not, has been impacted by NASA technology. We are the next generation of explorers. All right, let's meet Ravi Pakash in person. Ravi is in our sandbox at the JPL in situ instrument laboratory. And wait a minute, Ravi, where did that beard come from? <laughs> Hi, Gay. Yeah, you know, there, were, there were about 10 of us that decided on the day we launched to Mars that we were going to shave and then not shave again for seven months until we landed on Mars. So I am extra excited that we landed, not only because we have a mission on the surface of Mars, but I have two little girls at home that love to pull my beard, and so I can finally put an end to that. <laughs> All right, so Ravi, help us out. What happens next? Now, clearly, InSight is not out of the woods just yet, correct? You're right. So we have some very important steps ahead of us. The first is that we have to deploy our solar arrays. This is what the spacecraft is doing right now. It's deploying these two solar arrays so that we get energy from the sun. Uh, this is one of the most important things that we have to do right now. After that, we're going to do a series of checkouts on our spacecraft to make sure that everything survived this harrowing entry, descent, and landing onto Mars. And then once that's complete, after the next few days, we'll start deploying our instruments onto the surface of Mars. So what exactly is involved with the instrument deployment? So this is the first time we're using a robotic arm to put instruments on the surface of Mars. Um, this is a process that um, will put our seismometer on Mars as well as the heat flow probe. And it ends up taking about three months, which sounds like a really long time. But this is because, you know, we have to be very careful and make sure everything happens just the way it needs to. Unlike Earth, we can't send a technician if something goes wrong. And so we just want to get it right the first time. All right. And we, in our interview, just heard that we may be looking at not until March before we get science. That's right. We get some amount of science immediately as far as the environment of Mars. We get wind data, temperature data, um, mag magnetometer data. But then once we start getting uh, seismic data, that will be in the March time frame. All right. And can you explain to me, Ravi, the ISIL, the, the, the test bed that you're at? What do you do there? So this is a Martian sandbox. For the past few years, we've had a great team that's been testing, deploying our instruments on a variety of different slopes and rocks. Now that we actually are on Mars, we're going to transform this area to look exactly like the place we landed and test out deploying our instruments one more time before we do it on the real thing. All right. Thanks, Ravi. Congratulations. Thank Thanks so much. 
Now that INSIGHT is on Mars, it needs some changes. INSIGHT is no longer cruising to Mars, so the team no longer needs the cruise mission support area. In a little while, the team will hand over operations to a new group sitting in another JPL control room. This is the surface mission support area. It's in another building here at JPL. This is where the team will be operating INSIGHT from here on. So the handover is the final step, and that will take place at about 1 o'clock our time. That's about a half hour away. For us, it's time to say goodbye. 